On behalf of the Emmanuel College's Center for Religion and its Contexts and United in Learning, I would like to welcome all of you to tonight's Gandhi Lecture, Becoming the Beloved Community, A Call to Transformative Discipleship, featuring the Reverend Michael Blair, General Secretary, General Counsel for the United Church of Canada. Welcome, Reverend Blair. Through academic and continuing education events, Emmanuel College's Center for Religion and its Contexts shares its distinctive contextual approach to the study of religion in all aspects. Theology and belief, historical development, lived experience, and diversity of expressions in the United Church and in other Christian contexts, contexts as well as in Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, and other religious understandings. I would like to give a quick thanks to Joanne Graham, Executive Assistant to the Principal of Emmanuel College, Michelle Voss Roberts, for doing the preliminary legwork for tonight's talk. I am deeply grateful. And also grateful to Susan Fort Fortner, Executive Assistant to Reverend Blair for her contribution to tonight. And to Stephen Fetter, from United in Learning, our partner in tonight's amazing evening. I can't thank Stephen enough for the work he's done and he is, and also the mentoring he's provided to me. Uh, and with that, I would like to ask Stephen to say a few words. Well, thank you, Sean. It's a delight to be with you tonight. And, and how exciting to be able to gather people from across the country this way to, to uh, hear, hear what Michael has to say. I, I think this is wonderful, Sean, that, that you and Emmanuel College have, have taken the initiative to, to uh, offer these lectures and to invite Michael as a guest speaker, uh, not just because he's my boss, but because he's always worth listening to. And, and he always has wonderful and luminous things to say. So simply to acknowledge, I'm excited and looking forward to this. I'm going to have a chance to moderate the question and answer after Michael's done. And I hope you folks will stick in and be ready with questions and that we can have some wonderful give and take after the thing is over. So, Sean, back to you. Thank you, Stephen. As we gather together virtually, we acknowledge the sacred land on which the University of Toronto operates and the land on which I am personally situated. This area has been a site of human activity for 15,000 years plus. This land is a territory of the Huron-Wendat and Katoon First Nations, the Seneca, and most recently, the Mississaugas and the Credit River. The territory was a subject to the dish with one spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement between the Iroquois Confederacy and Confederacy of the Ojibwe and allied nations to, peace, to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Today, the meeting place of Toronto is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work in the community on this territory. As a settler, I take on the responsibility of learning about historic and current relationships and my desire to engage in building right relations. I am also mindful of broken covenants and the need to strive to make right with all our relations. Sorry. And now I would like to introduce Andrew Aitchison, our admissions counselor and recruitment coordinator at Emmanuel College to say a few words about Emmanuel College's academic programs and scholarships. Thanks, Sean. Hello, everyone. It's so nice to be with you tonight. I just want to take a quick moment to uh, share some exciting opportunities we have at Emmanuel College. Uh, first of all, did you know that thanks to the John W. Billis Grant, United Church members engaged with the candidacy pathway towards ordination, can do a three-year Master of Divinity degree at Emmanuel College, tuition-free. That's exciting. If you're not a United Church person, we also have excellent funding options to complete a three-year MDiv with our Ecumenical Theological Education Grant. Also, if the MDiv is not your cup of tea, we've got 50% tuition grants for full-time students in all other programs in their first year. 
And if you're not looking to do a full master's degree, we have two new seven credit post baccalaureate certificates, one in Christian theology and one in theology and interreligious engagement. So if you want to just get a little taste of uh, theological education, that would be a great option. The pandemic has plunged us into the joys and challenges of online learning, which will continue this summer and fall for all our courses. Many of these are available for auditing as well. And, but we're exploring, because of this, we're exploring options for a distance model for our Master of Divinity. So stay tuned for some uh, exciting developments in that area. Finally, tomorrow afternoon is our Day with Emmanuel open house, which will be, of course, online uh, from one till three in uh, Eastern time. And this is a great opportunity to learn more about our programs we offer and con to connect with some current students and faculty. Uh, applications are being received until April 30th, so there's still lots of time to apply and join us in the fall. I'm always happy to meet with people one-on-one -on -one with application or people discerning applications and whether this is the place for you. So uh, I hope you can you feel free to direct message me through this evening with uh, email with your email and we can set up an appointment. But uh, there will also be a link put in the chat right now. Um, that has all this information I've shared and you can find lots more of information on our website under future students. Thank you so much for your time and, and enjoy this wonderful evening. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, Andrew. Um, now I will hand the floor over to Professor Michelle Voss Roberts, principal of Emmanuel College, who will introduce tonight's Gandier lecture. Thank you, Sean. And thank you all of you for being here tonight. On behalf of Emanuel College, welcome to tonight's special event. Named after the college's first principal, Alfred Ganger, this lectureship reflects the college's relationship with the United Church of Canada from its founding until the present day, as well as our intent to bridge conversations between the college and the wider UCC context. Alfred Ganger, born in 1861, served several congregations of the Presbyterian Church in Canada. Before becoming principal of Knox College, he was moderator of the Presbyterian General Assembly and went over to the United Church at the time of Union. He served as the first principal of Emmanuel College from 1928 to 1932. He raised the funds to build Knox College, which was to have been a seminary for the new denomination. When the building remained with the Presbyterians, he then raised the funds for the Emmanuel College building. I learned from reading his obituary in the June 14, 1932 New York Times that after all of that hard work, he passed away only a few days after his retirement as principal of Emmanuel. Ganger taught in the areas of pastoral theology and Christian mission, both of which are relevant to tonight's talk. Theological education since then has changed in important ways. At that time, all of the candidates for ministry attending Emmanuel College were white men. One of our alumni called my attention to the fact that the first Friday in March is the World Day of Prayer. And some, some of you may have attended a service earlier today. The World Day of Prayer was first held way back around Ganger's time, organized, with, organized by what would become the Women's Interchurch Council of Canada. It was an ecumenical movement led by lay women with a vision of, quote, growing Christ's kingdom through prayer, fostering unity, and having a voice in social justice. Voices for racial justice were audible in Canada back then. The inheritors of those white men at Emmanuel and those ecumenically minded women at prayer need to hear them still. And since then, the World Day of Prayer, insofar as it's become genuinely global and ecumenical, is an example of how interchurch relationships can hold open the space of anti-racist learning. Today, Emmanuel College is part of an ecumenical consortium, the Toronto School of Theology. We are in solidarity with the United Church of Canada's commitment to become an anti-racist institution. 
Our statement of that which we hold dear, D-E-A-R, describes it as a commitment to dignity, equity, accountability, and responsibility, dear. The diversity of our faculty and student body is transforming us. We now approach Ganger's fields, pastoral theology and mission through the lens of intercultural development, which has been a particularly exciting development. Our work with the intercultural development inventory in the first year class even inspired the students this year to go deeper and to support one another through a student only intercultural development series in which they meet in small groups to explore and understand experiences of one's own and others' cultures. Their conversations aim to locate and articulate personal positioning, reflect on intercultural experiences, identify personal hesitations, and practice deep listening, suspending judgment, compassionate curiosity, and asking good questions. Those are our students, and I'm extremely proud of them. Those attitudes and skills are crucial to ministry, to leadership, and to care in multi-religious and racially diverse settings. And so tonight, the Ganger Lecture will be delivered by the Reverend Michael Blair, Sec General Secretary of the General Council of the United Church of Canada. He's held this role since November 1st, 2020. Before that, he served in the General Council Office as Executive Minister since 2008, as Executive Minister for Ethnic Ministry, Executive Minister of Communities and Ministry, and Executive Minister Church and Mission. Before joining the General Council staff, he served as the Executive Director of the Toronto Christian Resource Centre, which was a ministry of the then Toronto South Presbytery now Shining Waters region. Michael was admitted to the Order of Ministry in 2010 and has previously served as a congregational minister for a number of Baptist churches in Toronto and St. Catharines, Ontario. He's a staff member with InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at the University of Toronto and as a community chaplain with the Ontario Multi-Faith Council's Reintegration Program. Reverend Blair has made incalculable contributions to the United Church of Canada and beyond. In addition to supporting the Canadian Church's programs for mission and ministry, the Migrant Church Working Group, Black Clergy Group, and more, on a global scale, he was responsible for managing global ecumenical programs and the Global Partnership Program. He exercised leadership with the World Council of Churches, World Communion of Reformed Churches, and World Methodist Council. And he was responsible for initiating truly monumental developments, such as associate relationships for migrant churches, full communion with the United Church of Christ, and mutual recognition of ministry with the United Church of Christ in the Philippines and the Presbyterian Church in the Republic of Korea. Michael has been a prophet in the church and at Emmanuel College. In the first conversation he and I ever had, he raised the importance of churches being connected with the neighborhoods around them and of candidates for ministry trained at Emmanuel to prepare for community engagement to be central to their ministry. When he came to preach in chapel, he called us out to confront racism in the church. He did not sugarcoat the message. Black lives matter. Black lives matter to God and black lives matter in the church. At the same meeting that covenanted with Michael and his new role, the 43rd General Council voted and declared the intent to become an anti-racist church. So prepare to be called in this lecture, becoming the beloved community, a call to transformative discipleship. Welcome General Secretary Michael Blair. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bus Roberts, for your welcome and for the opportunity to participate in this lecture series. As I begin, I want to acknowledge the territory on where I'm located, a territory governed by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. 
I acknowledge the people who have stewarded this land, recognizing that they represent multiple nations, including the Heron Windat, Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and most recently the Mississaugas of the Credit. And even today, continue to host many nations, indigenous, settler, and newcomers. As I honor them, I also acknowledge and honor my ancestors from the African continent. My posture as I commit, my posture and commitment as I acknowledge these ancestors is to be, is one of a learner, a listener, and a seeker of justice. As I begin this lecture, I want to locate myself as a man of African descent from enslaved people serving with and among the ancestors of the enslavers. And also one who has embraced the faith tradition of the um, enslavers as my own. Let me also say that I come to this conversation tonight as a practitioner and not as an academic. My perspective has been shaped by the tradition of Anglicanism, Pentecostalism, Baptist and Reformed, and from my years of pastoral ministry. All of this accompanies me in my role as General Secretary of the United Church of Canada and forms part of what I bring to the conversation tonight. When the announcement came out that I was appointed as the General Secretary, there was uh, much excitement in many parts of the church. And in some ways, I must confess that it was scary for me to hear some of the excitement people had communicated about my, my appointment. At times, I wondered if the excitement was related to my identity and the reality that I would be the first person of African descent in this particular role. Some folks who knew me well wondered about my capacity for punishment. I must say, however, that for me, this is an incredible time to be church and to have the opportunity to give leadership to a particular denomination, such as the United Church of Canada. Although the narrative of decline has captured our imagination, and yes, it is true that numbers don't lie, church attendance has been declining, secularization is increasing, increasingly evident, finances are down, and those who regularly attend are aging. Coupled with the impact of both uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic of racism, particularly anti-Black racism, it is difficult at times to feel hopeful. But at the same time, the possibility of being church in new ways is incredibly captivating. What I hope to offer in our time together, and I hope I will do it with some measure of responsibility, is to provide a response to the question, is there a future for the church? My answer is a resounding yes. Aside from the fact that the church is God's to do what God chooses, I firmly believe that the church still has a future but it will require a significant reorientation, a reorientation by the spirit to draw from the words of the song of faith. That reorientation relates firstly to our understanding of the nature of the church, our ecclesiology. I will be suggesting that we need to think theologically about the church's identity. COVID-19 has raised a number of issues. My colleague and friend, the Reverend Dr. Rob Hay, 
of the Anglican, an Anglican priest in the UK names a few of the challenges. He asks the question, what is the relationship to place and space? How does geography play out in terms of our understanding as, of church? Is faith personal or collective? Is our gathering about celebration, worship, or is it about equipping the saints? Question about communion and its meaning. So I want to, for us to kind of think a, a bit that about what needs to happen theologically or ecclesiology, ecclesiologically about our understanding of church. One conversation that I was a part of recently raised the question of whether our understanding of the communion of the saints could provide some way of framing our virtual experience uh, of, of worship and being church in these particular days. These are questions that need some time for reflection as they may help us to shape uh, our practice of ministry going forward, whether we remain in a virtual space or we return to in-person worship. Secondly, I think our reorientation will require us to discover the tradition and language of discipleship. For me, I think we have lost um, the, the whole notion of what it means to be disciples, follower of Jesus. We will need to move from a language of members and adherents for those who are part of our communities to a language of disciples. I can hear it now. I can hear your mind working, thinking that the notion of disciples in some ways has tied up with it issues of power. Some of you are old enough may remember incidents around uh, Jonestown. But I want us to think about what it means to be uh, a follower of this person, Jesus, and to think about those with which we gather and ourselves as disciples on the way together, that we are a community of disciples. We're not simply members of a congregation. And I think when we, when we find ourselves thinking about ourselves as members of a congregation, we lose sight of the mission and ministry that God has called us to engage. And so tonight I want us to, to think a little bit about what it means to reorientate ourselves to, to talk about the issue of discipleship. Maybe those of us who are United Church are familiar uh, with the words of the song, which we often sing at, end, at the end of a, a, a worship service, go and make a difference. I wonder though, if it is about inviting people to come and make a difference, to discover what it means to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus in this time, in this place and now. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me say a further word about our wider context. We are living in a time characterized by xenophobia, militarism, fascism, ecological threat, and fear. It is also a time where we see significant number of people across the globe marginalized by economic disparity. We see the commodification of identities, violence and racism, and racial inequities. COVID-19 has and is continuing to reshape our lives and understanding of the world. And for that matter, the church. COVID-19 has been an experience of the great unveiling. 
from the precariousness of employment, economic and social disparity, and the impact of determinants of health on immigrants and minority communities to the death of George Floyd. One thing is abundantly clear. We cannot revert to what was. We need to chart a new future. And this new future will require us attending, among other things, to the challenge of both global and local economic disparity. We will need to attend to the decentering of whiteness and the dismantling of systemic racism. And we will need to attend and recommit ourselves to a caring for the earth. The question of how to meaningfully engage these challenges is one not just for the society as a whole, but is a, a, a particular calling for the church. I'm reminded of uh, the parable that we find in the um, prelude to the statement called Mending the World from 1997, uh, produced by the United Church. It tells the parable of uh, Robert, um, Rabbi uh, Hersel. And it, we're told that he used to tell the story that when God, the Holy One, gets up in the morning, God gathers the angels of heaven around and asks this simply, simple question. Where does my creation need mending today? And then Rabbi Herschel would continue, theology consists of worrying about what God worries about when God gets up in the morning. So the question for us tonight is, do we think that God worries about the issues of economic with its disparity does God worry about the issues of racism and racial exclusion? And does God worry about God's creation? I think if we answer yes, then it requires of us this reorientation of thinking about what it means to be church and thinking about what it means to be thinking and talking about discipleship as opposed to membership. So as I've been uh, thinking about these issues of uh, reimagining our understanding, coupled with the challenges and opportunities of this particular time of COVID-19 for both the society and the church, I have found myself increasingly drawn to two theological themes. The first is Martin Luther King's concept of the beloved community. And the second is the call to discipleship, which came from the Arusha Mission Conference held by the World Council of Churches Commission on World Mission and Evangelism. So let me share with you how I think these two con concepts can be helpful in offering us some clue about how we might engage and embrace the current reality um, as we imagine a new future and the possibilities for the church. The concept of the beloved community is a central feature in King's ministry as, um, as a civil rights leader. He's often said, our goal is to create a beloved community and this will require a qualitative change in our soul as well as a quantitative change in our lives. 
a world where everyone understands their interconnectedness with each other as a world characterized by justice and love. The notion of the reality of a community characterized by justice, interconnects, interconnectedness, and love was uttermost in um, King's mind. The challenge for him to dismantle racism and desegregation was not simply an issue for the society as a whole. Desegregation was not the end goal the beloved community was. So King invited everyone to participate in the work of building the beloved community. In his book, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos, Our Community, he uh, paints this picture. This is in relationship to the Montgomery um, March. He says, as I stood with them and saw white and black, nuns and priests, ministers and rabbis, labor organization, lawyers, doctors, housemaids, shop workers, brimming with vitality and enjoying a rare comradeship. I knew I was seeing a microcosm of the mankind of the future in this moment of luminous and genuine brotherhood. Apologies for the language. I'm quoting directly from King and uh, King in his particular time. So King saw the engagement of all people, no matter what their skin colors were, no matter what their status in life was, being a part of a community that would enable not only the dismantling of segregation, but also build the capacity for a new world and a new future. The beloved community was not a dream. It was rooted in King's understanding of his faith and the biblical themes of rec reconciliation and redemption. We get this vision from Revelation chapter seven. After this, I looked and there was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation and from all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the lamb robed in white with palm branches in their hands. This is why King expressed his disappointment to the white church leaders in his letter from uh, Birmingham jail. He says this, and I will quote, I must honestly reiterate, <clears throat> I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who has nurtured in its bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessing and who will remain true to it as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. When I was suddenly catapulted into the leadership of the bus protest in Montgomery, Alabama, a few years ago, I felt we would be supported by the white church. I felt that the white ministers, priests, and rabbis of the South would be among our strongest allies. Instead, some of them have been outright opponents, refusing to understand the freedom movement <clears throat> and the misrepresentation its, uh, and misrep misrepresenting its leaders. All too many others have been more cautious than courageous and have remained silent 
the eye behind the anesthetizing security of stained glass windows. In spite of my shattered dreams, I come to Birmingham with the hope that the white religious leadership of this community would see the justice of our cause and with deep moral concern would serve as a channel through which our just grievances could reach the power structure. I had hope that each of you would understand, but again, I have been disappointed. Just an aside, it feels like nothing has changed. It feels like that the issue of racism and anti-Black racism and the struggle for liberation and freedom and hope for people of African descent continues to be a bargaining chip in white spaces and that white silence continues. So not much has changed. And part of King's notion of the beloved community was that we would understand that we are in this together. We are connected together. And for me, it's important that we understand this, that, that the gift of the notion of the beloved community is that we are together in the same place that whatever impacts one impacts the other and impacts all. And so for me, the, this notion of being a, a space where reconciliation and redemption and further King will talk about love and justice, meet and dance and kiss is a space that we need to think about as we think about what is this new reality of church. We have not, I don't think, lived up or lived into a space where we see church as about a community of interconnected believers and individuals who know something of the love and justice and care. And in some ways, I think we get caught off guard because there's often this expectation that communities of faith are truly communities of justice. And for King, you see, um, the beloved community is always a community of justice. The beloved community is always a space that understands that any form of injustice is a threat to justice everywhere. And so cannot simply pick and choose as you pick bones out of a fish in thinking about what it needs to be attending to. So for King, the love community is an essential part of what it means to engage in seeking for justice and liberation for all. The theme of reconciliation and redemption are critical to under understanding of the beloved community. It is the lived reality of reconciled humanity. We hear the echoes of the New Testament's invitation to us to be reconciled to one another this reconciled human community is one that not only engages in an expression of self-love, it is one that engages in non-violent transformation of a society. In the reconciled community, there's an understanding of mutual belonging. The other critical thing to say is that King's concept of philosophy of the beloved community are justice and love. We hear echo in his affirmation that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. It is a principle of love, which in King's framework is the transformative element. Because 
of his understanding of the beloved community, King saw a relationship between economics, racial justice, and inequity and creation. There were certainly parts of the context of the civil, they were certainly part of the context of the civil rights movement in the 1960s. He was convinced that these issues needed to be addressed in order to enable everyone to enjoy the fullness of life. So in King's imagination and in King's practice, the beloved community was a space that offered radical hospitality to everyone. It was a space that recognized and honored the image of God in every human person. It was a space where uh, personal authenticity was, was uh, the expectation, that there was true respect and validation of others. It was a space where there was recognition and affirmation, not eradication of differences. It was a space where we would listen. It's a space that tolerates ambiguity. It's a space that builds an increasing level of trust. It is a space that acknowledges conflict and recognizes that pain is part of the difficult work that we have to do together. It's a space that speaks truth and love, always considering ways to be compassionate with one another. So let me see if I can illustrate this concept with the beloved community and to, to, to see how it could help us address the issue of anti-Black racism. In May of 2020, as we witnessed the murder of George Floyd and endured those eight minutes and 46 seconds, our world changed. In a mysterious way, the penny dropped and there was the great unveiling of the reality of systemic racism. That reality has in many ways led to some individual types of responses. Many of us have found ourselves reading books about racism and the experience of, of black folks. We found ourselves joining book clubs and attending lectures and making commitments that we're gonna do better, that we're gonna attempt to be more inclusive uh, of finding um, people of color to serve and to show up to our things. And yet one of the challenges of our approach especially those of us, those in the white church, is that the approach costs nothing. It doesn't cost anything. For King, the notion of the beloved community is that the participation in the beloved community cost everyone equally. Reading a book, being part of a book club, making commitments to be anti-racist doesn't cost us much. It's easy because it doesn't cost us. So how does the beloved community push us beyond this notion of participation without cost? I think if we live into the reality of the beloved community, then I think among many things, these three things would be true. We would recognize the need for reconciliation. And part of that reconciliation requires of us a lamentation. The thing I long for is to hear folks in the white community, not 
talk about whether they feel guilty and they feel embarrassed. I need folks to lament that they have been part of a system, whether intentionally or unintentionally, that have been oppressive to people of color. And the beloved community, it's, it's because it's committed to reconciliation, it starts in that place of asking the question, how do we move towards reconciliation? And I think the starting point of that reconciliation is a lament. And in that conversation of reconciliation, is the issue of what do we do about recreation? Because that's an important part of this. And to remember that re uh, recreation is not simply about money. The second thing is true. If we, if we understand this notion of being in a community, an inclusive community, a community where we, um, a community of love and justice, a community that's rooted in reconciliation and redemption is that we begin to move away from the language of allyship. If one more person says to me they want to be an ally, I'm going to scream. Because the challenge is when we talk about allyship, it does not cost us anything. You see, the, the notion is that an ally uses their privilege to make space for the one who is excluded. And the, ally, the notion of allyship counts on the fact that I have privilege and that privilege I hang on to. And the language the understanding of the beloved community moves us to another language, a language of being with, that to recognition, recognition that, that the issues are, it's not just you folks who are racialized have a problem that I'm gonna attempt to fix, but it's that we collectively have a problem that we collectively need to fix together. And I'm not sure we're there yet. And I think only when we embrace this notion of a community rooted in justice, reconciliation and love and redemption, and to see our churches, to understand who we are as the people of God is about a community rooted in those ideas we're always gonna use language that others or moves us away from each other. And finally, I think that if we understand this notion of being a, the beloved community, then what are the things that is gonna be critical is that we are building relationship with communities. And folks, I just need to say this, <laughs> that in all our attempt to respond to the challenges of anti-Black racism, we're not only are we trying to do it alone, but we're disconnected from communities of people of color and not talking about simply having friendships and relationships with people with a few people of color it's about being in relationship with communities recognizing that there's a diversity of experience of people in those communities and we need to be able to embrace those and to be in relationship because part of the beloved community is that it is always in relationship. The beloved community is always in relationship. The beloved community is not disconnected 
from its context. It is always in relationship. And it's because it's always in relationship, it becomes a space of transformation. So I think as we think about the future of the church and as we think about a new um, way of thinking theologically about the church, for me, it's important to then think about this notion of the church being a beloved community. It's about relationship. It's about reconciliation. It's about redemption. It's about love. It's about justice. And those are the things which transform our world. So I think to embrace the beloved community, we need some new theological reimagining. My time's almost up. So I think for me, uh, a couple of things in that. We need to understand uh, a, a new way of understanding what it is that we are called to do. I think understanding our call impacts how we see ourselves. And that we are called, you know, in 2013, the World Council of Churches um, approved a new mission uh, statement called um, Together Towards Life, TTL. And one of the things that, that TTL reminds us of is this notion that mission is at the heart of God, that mission is empowered by the spirit, and that there is something about mission which is about a, a reorientation from talking about centers, but to recognize that there is uh, the, the terms that was introduced was mission from the margin. That, that we need to be in the marginal spaces and we need to allow those who are marginalized for whatever reason to lead us in the mission and ministry that, that God has called us to do because part of that mission and ministry is about mending the world, bringing healing and wholeness to God's creation. And, and of course, you see, the... the the beloved community is always in touch with those who are in the margins. Because those who are in the margins are the victims of the injustices of this world. And it is important for the beloved community to be in that space. So we need to, again, reimagine. And, and for me, this language of, of, of um, mission that is driven by those from the margin, mission being the heart of God, that, that the beloved community is a space where we understand that we are called to partner with God in God's healing of God's creation. So what does it mean to be a community of faith when we understand our very being is about engaging with God in what God wants to do in the world. So it means that we are always people who are discerning, attentive, open to what God is doing in God's world. So, you know, that's the agenda. <laughs> that's why we're together to hear, to discern what God is doing in God's world and to join with God in what God wants to accomplish in God's world. And to do that, folks, then we need to understand something of what it means to be a disciple. And I, I'll end here in saying this, that what, we, what, what I discover as I read scripture is that Jesus demonstrates to us what it means to be a disciple. And, and I just want to end with three things about what Jesus does and then just weave things back together quickly. But Jesus is, what Jesus demonstrates about discipleship is that, that it's always incarnational. You can't be a disciple if you're not connected to context. 
the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. So that's, that, that, that's, that's important. Second thing is that uh, what we find uh, in the ministry of Jesus in terms of um, Jesus' uh, sense of discipleship, uh, not only is it incarnational and it's rooted in place and space, it's also about clarity of identity. And, and for me, it comes back to this notion of the beloved community. That we know who we are. We know whose we are. And part of this, that discovery is about understanding the mission that God has called us to. And I think the third piece that Jesus demonstrates about discipleship is this. That a disciple is one who is always willing to risk, to take up the cross, and to follow. And so I think in this particular time, and I had lots more to say, but my time is up around discipleship. In this particular time, the church has a future, and the future of the church is rediscovering again what it means to be a beloved community, a community that is about reconciliation, redemption, love, and justice, a community that understands itself, that it is participating, it's called, it's identity, that the love is about participating with what God wants to do in God's world bring healing and wholeness and the fullness of life. And we understand that we come at this not as members of an institution, but as disciples, follower of the one called Jesus, who is connected to place, who is clear about identity, and who is always risking. We are called to be the beloved community. And through the space of the beloved community to transform our world. Well, my goodness. Thank you, Michael. Michelle Voss Roberts at the beginning talked about how you didn't mince words and you told the truth in ways that hurt and you did again tonight. I said at the beginning that I knew you had luminous things today and I'm still feeling bowled over. Thank you. Thank you for such a clear theological articulation. I think so many of us who are practitioners run from one crisis to the next and one fire to the next. And we don't always put the theological grounding under it that clearly or that helpfully. So I want to thank you for that and for that vision of, of what the church is called to be and called to do and, and who we are together called to be. So uh, what a great evening. Friends, we have about half an hour to respond to your questions. And what I'd like to do is invite you to put them into the chat. And I'm going to try to cut and paste them into a Word document and do some curating so that if three people are asking a similar question, I'll try to uh, mush them together so we can get to as many different topics as possible. Um, I'm inviting Michael not to look at the chat because it's just distracting, but uh, uh, I'll, I'll do my best to, to pose the questions that are coming in, and uh, uh, while he's answering one question, I'll pick up the next. So feel free to use the chat. This is your opportunity to, uh, to, uh, to uh, push for a little more and, uh, and hear a little more. Michael, one of the questions that came in while you were talking I guess was just looking for a few more specifics. If this is the theological grounding, 
How do we live that out? And Jenny says, I can't be fully in a same-sex community because I'm not that kind of person. I can't be fully in a community of people of color because I'm white. So how do how do we build these relationships and how do we, uh, as members of different communities, connect in this way? Michael, you've muted yourself, there you go. So uh, for me, I think it's important to recognize that um, the gift of um, the gift of a being is our our diversity. And I think we you don't have to have walked in my shoes to necessarily understand that um, as a man of color, um, as a person of African descent, there there are issues that I experience. What I what I need you to do <laughs> in relationship, in relationship, right? Um, what I need you to do in relationship is is a couple of things. Not say that is like when I experience this, because immediately you you negate um, my experience. Um, it is also about um, being able to, to honor and celebrate um, what I bring. So all the diversities to celebrate that, to recognize that we are in something that's bigger than us. And that thing which is bigger than us is our diversity, right? There's something about our diversity. And it is something about, I think, uh, understanding the need, um, one, we can fix everything, but to understand that if we are um, any way, shape or form contributing to the difficulties, right? So, um, you know, we, we pride ourselves in this, and this for me to come back to this notion of the beloved community, when we think of ourselves as church, we think about who's in and who is out, right? We have all kinds of process to divide who is in there and out. If we think of ourselves as, a, as, as the beloved community, then everybody is in and nobody is out. And in the in, we discover how to be together. And it, uh, I guess my bottom line, long way to answer the question is, Relationship, 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 relationship. Celebrate our difference. Relationship, relationship, relationship. Um, because it's being in together that we are able to actually recognize what it means to be fully human, I would say. Yeah. Thank you. Uh bunch of different questions here. And forgive me, friends, I'm going to mush them together. There's people asking for uh, some specifics. Uh, George says, you know, interested in some examples of when the church is becoming a beloved community and where it's not. Somebody else says, polity only allows voting, holding office, memberships. So how do we change our polity so it allows participation by discipleship? Somebody else says, I've learned the etymology of the word disciple. It's rooted in the verb to learn. So how do we help? be learners. Uh, I think I think there's some, some, if this is our foundation, I think the questions are about, can you give us some examples of how to's? So just, just an easy question, Michael. Just an easy question. <laughs> I, I think it's interesting that we've, we've gone to practice to, to structure. Yeah. Um, about so how do we figure this out? Um, in terms of, of structure, I think I think, you know, the church will figure out the, the question. I mean, right now, for example, um, you know, the, there's a request for us to do some work about our understanding of membership, right? Because we've had this thing. But I don't want to start at the structure. So the question is, excuse me, what are we inviting people into? to become part of our communities, right? So do we understand ourselves fundamentally as, um, as a community of faith to be people who understand that we are called to a 
type of life <laughs> that requires a number of things. So as a, uh, a follower, I, part of it, I need to learn, uh, you know, learn what it is that I'm following or who is it that I'm following so that, that we're actually talking to people about um, this Jesus that we follow, because that's a fundamental. So who is this Jesus? What is this Jesus calling us to? I think uh, part for me, part of it is how do we tell the stories of Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting that the, 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 the New Testaments are narratives, you know, the, the Gospels are narratives about what Jesus is about, how Jesus encountered people. So um, the woman at the well, you know, the rich young ruler, that, that there is a, we don't approach people with a judgmental attitude. We approach people for who they are. So how do we invite people into that, that, that space? So I think part of the discipleship thing is, is understanding that what we are about is inviting people into a relationship with this Jesus to discover what that means. We don't do that. You know, I, I love the lectionary because it, it provides me with a discipline of, of not just preaching my favorite text mm -hmm. and, it, and it forces me to, to do some studies. But in some ways, the lectionary doesn't help our communities get to know who Jesus is because it's all over the map. We need a more mm -hmm. consistent way. So I, I think, I think that's, for me, that's that's fundamental. Rather than let's we'll figure out uh, what that means. So uh, I'll tell you a story. It's it's not my story, but but it's an example. Um, the story is told. Um, well, you you know uh, Whoopi Goldsberg, Whoopi's movie. Um, what's it called? She did a couple of them with the sisters, the nuns. Um, okay, yeah, Sister Act. Sister Act. Yeah. Well. The, the congregation where where the first uh, movie is filmed, mm -hmm. uh, part of the story behind that was that a woman was at choir practice. She came out of choir practice and there was a, a young woman on their car. She had to go. And so she said, the, she started up a conversation with the young woman. The young woman said that she was a singer. Um, and she said, well, I'm just coming from choir practice. We have choir practice every week. Why don't you come the mm. next the next week, right? Um, and went on our merry way, just thinking that she dodged a bullet, right? She needed to go. This woman was on our car. Well, the next week, the woman showed up, right? Okay. And um, other women started to sh show up. And they worked with these women in terms of most of them were working on the street, right? And they, they just recognized that part of what they were called to do was to love these women. And, and the first woman is a medical doctor now, hmm. right? So you love, you love people because that's what disciples do. Disciples engage. And, you know, we don't go to the book, the manual, and figure out how we need <laughs> to deal with people, right? So I think the church becomes the beloved community when in many ways it doesn't start by asking the question who you are and where you come from the church becomes the beloved community when it says you are welcome and in the welcome and in our journey together we discover who we are but we often start by asking where are you from who you are kind of thing rather than saying you're welcome we are people who are trying to figure out what it means to live in this world in a way. So I think that for me, that's, you know, it seems vague, but I think in some ways that's, that's, that's the piece, right? Um, how do you, um, another illustration that I'm a part of. So um, I was part of a congregation in Parkdale here mm -hmm. in Toronto. And the congregation was made up of street, street adults. Um, lots of folks who lived on the street normally, lots of folks who had mental health um, thing. We did a meal every week. Mm -hmm. And the instinct was to say, these people live on the street, they have nothing to contribute. Mm -hmm. The community decided 
that everybody would contribute to the meal. So mm -hmm. if you didn't have something to bring, you came and helped with the cooking or you set the table or you help with cleanup. And it was just a space of everybody contributes, right? And it's not this kind of, you know, I mean, I, I had resources, I could bring something uh, for a meal. It's not that those of us who had carried the show, everybody contributed, right? So some weeks I didn't care anything and I was in the kitchen washing dishes mm -hmm. at the end, end of the day, but it's that creating a space where we, what, where, what we say all are welcome because we are on this journey and we're not filtering um, at, the, at the outset. So helpful, thank you. Right. So let me shift gears because I'm, I'm aware of time and I've got <laughs> oodles of questions. A number of people are, are reacting to your critique of the, of the notion of allyship. I wonder if you could say a little more about um, where you see us needing to move and what would be a, a more costly response from people who look like me than allyship. Because I, I, people are not disagreeing with you. They're just um, surprised and uh, wanting some more. Good question. So, and... And I partly have been been struggling with what the word is, hmm. what's the technical term. Um, if you do away with with allyship, I think my struggle is the basic principle of allyship, mm -hmm. because what allyship does initially, fundamentally, it doesn't admit that that I have a problem. Sure. Right. Uh, it says you have a problem and I need to help you with your problem. Hmm. And so, uh, and allyship has this notion as well, as I was saying, allyship has this notion of privilege and power that, that my privilege, whether it's seen or unseen, but that I have some privilege that I can use to kind of make space. Right. Hmm. So it's not a, it's not a, it's not a true kind of um, relationship of, of equality, right? So mm -hmm. when I come, so sometimes I say, I wanna flip it, that it's not that black folks need white folks as ally, but white folks need black folks as ally, which kind of shifts it a little mm -hmm. bit, turns it a little bit on mm -hmm. the head. But I think what we need is a, a terminology and I, you know, for the last couple of weeks, I've been struggling as I've been thinking about this, and I've been saying this for, for quite a while, yeah. is the language which captures this sense of mutuality, that we are in this together, that, that um, the, the issue of um, whether it's around sexual identity, gender identity, or racial identity, the issue is that, that the folks who are in power, who are enlightened want to help mm -hmm. but in their enlightenment in in their help they're not moving the needle they're not helping right they're they're so so for instance um a, an example for me is that you know we set <laughs> barriers to who could be in and out hmm. so we determine uh, that certain people, whether their skin color or their sexual identity or gender identity, couldn't fit in. And so we've enlightened now and we say there's space for you. But what we haven't been able to do in kind of there is space for you is do what I said. I think, I think it starts with a lamenting, mm -hmm. not a feeling guilty but it's a lamenting of the fact that we have created the obstacles that now we're trying to correct. And we're trying to correct those obstacles using the same methodology <laughs> that created them in the same, in the yeah. first place. So I think uh, for me, this kind of the beloved community, this sense of we're in this together, it's in that space. We need to together figure out what the word is. Um, and, you know, allyship, 
I don't think is a helpful word. Um, a, a webinar that Jordan Sullivan hosted a year ago on uh, being trans. And he was trying to move people from being allies to being accomplices. And I think in that language, he was looking for something that would be more costly without ever trying to presume that we were, that, that I didn't have more privilege because of the color of my skin than, than you do, um, that there is a difference. <laughs> Yeah, and, and the other thing I would say in my experience is that the folks who are who see themselves as ally aren't people who are willing to get out of the way mm. and create spaces for those who have been pushed out. Um, right. So so part of part of the journey is in my power and privilege, I'm still holding space, but I'm gonna help you solve your problem, but I'm not gonna move out of the way to create space for you. So there's some tension in that. And I, I think folks, uh, on one level, there's no perfect, but, but <laughs> I hope you hear what I'm trying to say. What I'm trying to say is that if we're gonna dismantle this thing called racism, we first of all need to understand that it's not black folks who created the problem. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, Black folks are inviting you to be in relationship with them to create the what it what it should have been in the first place. And it's not just for you to say, I'm going to help solve the problem, but I'm part of the problem. And together, we're in this trying to find a way through it. I'm scrolling through the chat and, and the, there's far too much here to, to address in the next seven or eight minutes. Still a, f a, a fair number of Practical. Uh, how do we put this into practice questions. Um, and I mean, some of the folks on the line are congregational leaders. And so they're imagining how you might say this in sermons or how it might impact congregational programming. Uh, some of them are saying to you, okay, you're a church bureaucrat. How does a denomination do these kinds of things? Um, I mean, I appreciate the hows are a lot harder to answer than the than the whys, and that the hows grow out of conversation and relationship. So, but so people are me, pushing for that. So so I, I right. think at you. So let me let me uh, talk, talk use a couple of examples. Sure. I have I have a colleague, uh, a friend um, that I've known for quite a number of years, and we meet um, every day for half an hour, where we check in, talk about what's going on uh, in our experience. We read the lectionary. So for the in the course of the week. Monday to Thursday, each day we read one of the readings from the lectionary. So one day it's the gospel, one day it's mm -hmm. the Old Older Testament, one day it's the psalm, one day it's... And then the, the Friday is just a check-in, total check-in day. And we do that and we try to relate what we're reading to what's going on in our lives. We pray together and we go on with our day. Mm -hmm. For me, that's a practice of discipleship, mm -hmm. right? Um, I have a bunch of friends, uh, you know, uh, one of my oldest friends is I've known for over 40 years and, um, it's a space where I can, uh, be in conversation about what's going on. And we, we talk theology, we talk life. Um, it's about disciple in, in a way, you know, mm -hmm. so I think part of the practice of it is, I think all of our minds are thinking about um, structure. Mm -hmm. Part of it is what we need to do is to say, who, how do we understand church? How do, how do we understand being a community? What drives this community? What sustains this community? So how do we continue to nurture that? So, um, you know, 
it's it's little prayer you know to people who pray together uh once a week uh it's it's people who are saying here is here is an issue that that i'm trying to make sense of how does my faith relate to this i'm trying to help me think it through right mm -hmm. it's it's I think it's just kind of creating, cultivating a space where we create the kind of freedom for people to kind of engage together and, and just let it grow. I mean, the, the example of Jesus is that it's one here, two there, you know, and each time is, is helping, helping them understand who they are, what they need to be about, um, pushing them to kind of learn and struggle with with the hard questions and supporting them and and the the questions we ask will shape the answers we come to i think yeah that's that's really helpful yeah you see and, and as a church bureaucrat i know my bureaucrat and i have <laughs> uh, there's stuff i have to do because i have to do but what would really turn my crank is our communities of faith really struggling in figuring out what it means to be a, 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 a beloved community mm -hmm. where um, you know some of the justice issues that we deal with from time to time people think they have an option about it well if 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 herschel's notion that god gets up every day and asks the question where is my where does my world need healing? It's not an add-on. It's the reason. It's our reason for being. It's the reason for being. Yeah. So we've got two minutes left, and then I'm going to turn things back to Sean. Um, but several different questions in the chat are coming at this in different ways. You're speaking appropriately and helpfully out of out of the black experience, and that's important, and we need to hear that. Can you talk for just a minute about how that connects to reconciliation with indigenous peoples or, or some of the, uh, the other justice issues that the church is also engaged in? Yeah, it's the same principle, right? I think- Which um, is what I thought you'd say, but, but, but say it. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the colonial pro project is what continues to harm um, black folks and to harm indigenous peoples. And so part of it is, is a work of um, understanding that the black folks and indigenous folks have a lot of similarities and differences and white folks have similarities and differences and that the task for, for each of us is to be, uh, how do we create, um, how do we create uh, again, back to my community of how do we create this community where we together learn how to decolonize ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, white folks have a certain work of decolonization that they have to do. Uh, black folks has a certain work of decolonization that, that we have to do, and so does Indigenous folks. So, you know, I was intentional when I started my talk by saying that, you know, I'm a uh, a person who comes from uh, my ancestor, ancestry is uh, the continent of Africa. Um, I come by way of Jamaica, which means that my ancestry is enslavement. I'm in a space where I am uh, working and serving ancestors of the people who enslaved my people. But I also have, have bought into the faith of my captors, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of my colonialism as well that I have to, ha I have to deal with because I know more about my Christian heritage than I know about my African heritage. Mm -hmm. And part of the recreation that needs to happen for people like me is how we um, rediscover our our African heritage and uh, and our African spirituality. And I think one of the things that um, those of us who are African descendant um, can learn from the indigenous communities is, is how to reclaim 
our spiritual heritage. So there's some conversation that needs to happen. The other thing to just say, Steve, in, in, into the question is that, um, is there room <laughs> for people like me who are passionate and can talk his way through anything um, with energy in our in our church life, right? So again, part of this building the beloved community is not a whole bunch of docile uh, black folks coming in or black folks who are gonna push. And are we prepared for that? Uh, you know, um, and that's that's an important that's another part of the conversation to be had. I will welcome you into webinar space, Michael, whenever you're free. <laughs> we need to hear this. And and the the comments in the chat are are echoing my enthusiasm. Yes, we need this passion. Uh, and people like me cannot always depend on people like you to do this work for us. We have our own work to do. But as but we need we to do, do our own work, and as we are in relationship together, God is present. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you for a wonderful evening. Thank you for so many different uh, uh, thoughts that are still running through my brain and everybody else's too. Friends, thank you for all your questions and comments on the chat. I've been gasping to try to collect them all and apprehend them while also listening to Michael. Uh, you have thoughts here that I didn't get a chance to address, and I apologize for that. But we have hit the rest of our the end of our time. And so I, I will say thank you for your for your graciousness, for your thoughts, for your for your comments, and for your participation tonight. And I'll turn things back over to Sean. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you, Stephen, for your um, very capable uh, facilitation tonight of our questions. Uh, it was an ex it was great a great um, conversation at the end there. I, I do appreciate that, and thank you. Um, again, Michael, for tonight, I'm deeply grateful on behalf of the Center for Religion and its Contacts, and also, in honest, in this, uh, I am grateful on a personal level uh, for tonight, for your honesty, your erudition, your presence. Um, and Bill Curvin, I'd like to cite him in his comment. He joined us on Facebook, as, as several people did uh, on the live stream. He's, and he said these were powerful echoes of Old Testament, lamentation and the meaning of offering. I will not offer to God offerings that cost us nothing. So thank you, Michael. And thank you all for joining us tonight. It's been really um, exhilarating to see the response. Not surprising, but really wonderful to have you all join us on a Friday evening, no less. <laughs> what a testament in itself. And um, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. In the Center for Religion, its context hosts lectures and conversations like the one tonight on an ongoing basis. Please uh, visit our website for upcoming events and also visit United in Learning's website. I just posted them right there for their great program that they have to offer on an ongoing basis. And I'm looking forward to more uh, ongoing collaborations with United Learning. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, everybody for tonight. Mm -hmm. And take Co care. Couple, couple of people have asked about the recording. So I should simply say that, yes, we did record. Yes, it will be available. We're going to host the recording at United and Learning. Sean will probably point to it too once it's there. But uh, yes. you can, you can yeah. find the recording within a couple of days. Give me a couple of days to edit so that we can boost Michael's sound in the middle where it was softer, and we'll try to even that out. And, and, it, it, and it is available on our Facebook page as well. Um, uh, immediately, if you wanted to watch rewatch it, or if you missed some of it, if you if you, if you lost connection, um, but yes, uh, I will be sending out an email to everybody in follow up, um, letting giving them links to the uh, the Facebook recording, but also to the recording that Stevens so uh, generously um, offered to uh, uh, put together, and uh, and that will be the best <laughs> version in terms of uh, watching. So. Uh, Hey, uh, watch out for that email and thanks. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Michael. Good night, everybody. We'll see you next time.
Take care.